So over the past several weeks, our senior pastor, Brian, has been uh, giving a sermon series where he talked about the, the story and popular play, The Nutcracker. And in this sermon series, he talked about the gifts that we can find in that story. He shared with us stories of braving the wilderness. He shared stories about how to stand up for what we believe in and how to push past the fear that comes along when we have to try something new or when we have to stand our ground. He talked about what it takes to try and adjust to new belief systems or to try new things and adjust our understanding. And as I followed along in this sermon series, I couldn't help but wonder, what's next? Maybe it was just restlessness on my part. Maybe it was this sense of feeling like a holiday season came in and flew by and now it's gone and I'm not even really sure what day it is. Maybe it's just a sense of overthinking. But I couldn't help but find myself about midway through December as Brian is preaching thinking, yeah, okay. But what else? And this isn't a new thing of, for me, this, this idea of thinking about what's next. We're getting ready to transition into a new year. And for me, I'm wondering, what's going to come in 2019? And this idea of thinking ahead is something I do pretty frequently. Whenever I'm planning a project, I'm constantly, as I work on one step, I'm thinking about the next step and so on. When I'm planning a curriculum, by the time we get through the first or second lesson of a six-week series, I'm already thinking about what we're going to talk about next. And if I'm working on a resolution for something, I'm not just thinking about what's going to happen when it gets done. I'm thinking about the reverberating impacts for the next 10, 20, 30 years. It's just how my brain works. And some might say that this is a good thing. It allows me to be innovative. It allows me to help develop new ideas and help push projects past the tipping point. In many ways, it helps me be successful. But in the same manner, it makes it really hard to stay in the present. If I'm being honest, there are times when I'm speaking with someone and I can feel my mind start to wander as they're talking to me. This is something that in particular my three sisters find very, very annoying, and they let me know about it frequently. I might say to one of them, how's your job going? And they'll say, why bother even answering because you're not listening? And they're right, I'm not. I'm almost always thinking about the next question, the next thing that I want to know about their lives because I'm interested, I genuinely care. But it often comes across as if I don't because my mind is constantly several steps ahead of the game. This became apparent several weeks ago while I was riding in the car with my girlfriend and we were going to finish our Christmas shopping. Like most of you, we were going from store to store trying to tick off the various people on our list and we were riding on the freeway. And during a lull of silence, I did what I often do and I said, what are you thinking? And she said, well, I'm not thinking anything nearly as deep as what you're thinking. And I thought, what? What do you mean? And so I asked her to explain herself, and what she shared is that she was thinking about the road signs as we passed them, or the buildings that we passed, or the new construction sites that were going up. She was thinking about the store we were going to go to, and she's wondering what sales they have, and whether or not she's going to be able to find what she needs for whoever she's shopping for. I said, okay. She said, but you are thinking about the problems of the world. You are thinking about world peace, or poverty, or disparities, and you're planning out all of the steps you think need to be taken to try to resolve whatever issue you have going on in your mind about it. And you're not even thinking about the next issue, you're thinking about the next 20 or 30. And even though it really bothers me when people say things like that, because I'm so stubborn and I don't like to admit it, she was right. I was thinking 20, 30 steps ahead about issues that had nothing to do with what we were doing that day. In no way, shape, or form was I in the moment. And I remember exactly what I was thinking about on that day. I was thinking about something that often occupies my mind. And I don't always know how to describe it, but basically I was just thinking about division. I was thinking about the division that I see and experience in the world. 
Whether it's with social media or in our communities or our families, I was thinking about every topic under the sun, about whether or not we're allowed to listen to classic Christmas songs anymore, whether or not we're allowed to talk about privilege or our political affiliation or whether or not we're donating to the right organization or the wrong organization. I was thinking about walls and voter registration and the list goes on and on and on because I am genuinely disturbed by the division that these topics cause in our society. It actually keeps me up at night. And I'm constantly trying to answer this question, which is how can we all get along and still maintain our beliefs? Because I think far too often in society, we're told that we have to choose. We have to change our belief systems to fit whatever new societal norm is popping up. Or we have to uphold our belief systems to maintain tradition. And if we choose the wrong side, then we have to give up relationships. That is what is happening in the common discourse of our society. And if you have heard me preach before, then you have heard me talk about this. You have heard me try and figure out the answer to this question because I genuinely want to know. For years, this topic continues to pop up in my sermons, and it's not because I think I have the answer. It's because I think if I talk about it enough, maybe we'll start to figure something out. We keep the conversation going. It's really just self-serving, which is what most preachers do. But I really want to know how can we maintain our relationships and get along and also maintain the integrity of our belief systems? Because I don't know about you, but the consistency of the polarization that's happening in our communities is truly terrifying. And the call to choose sides is ever present and ever pressuring. And if we went by social media alone, then the demand to proclaim our beliefs on any one topic, which I, for one, mostly don't know anything about, the call to proclaim those beliefs is staggering. We are constantly being asked to choose. And it doesn't matter, at least in my experience, what, size we, what side we choose. This side, that side, the middle. It seems like we're always upsetting someone. We are offending someone. Someone's feelings are hurt or they're angry or mad. And then what I see happening is because we just don't want to offend anyone and we don't really want to deal with the consequences of having to have an uncomfortable conversation, we just start to pull back altogether. And instead of cultivating deep and meaningful relationships, we are pulling those relationships up to the surface level. We are doing everything we can to avoid discomfort. And I think to myself, as I participate in that own experience myself, is that who we really are? Are we really going to be those people who lean away from uncomfortable conversations and bring our relationships to the surface level just so we don't have to deal? I just spent several days in St. Louis for a family wedding and it was amazing and wonderful and we danced and we had fun, but there weren't a lot of deep, meaningful, substantive conversations happening about what we believe. And that is because we have been talking a lot on Facebook as a family. And the more we post online, the less likely we are to bring it up in person. Because if someone got mad online, what's going to happen if I talk about my political affiliation in person or when I think about a wall or a Christmas song? And do I really want to start a fight? Do I really want to get blocked on Facebook, which I have been? So we pull back. And we keep things at the surface. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't sit well with me. There is nothing I love more than having a good cup of coffee and leaning in and saying, what is happening with your soul? Tell me the news of your soul. I need to know everything. I can't stand surface level conversations. So I'm trying to figure out what's next because I don't want to continue down that path. 
I'm just too stubborn for that. There has to be a way. And so I turn to what I often turn to when I'm seeking advice and seeking wise counsel. I turn to someone who I've preached about in front of you before, my scholarly crush, the one, the only, Brene Brown. Last April, we did an entire sermon series on her book, Braving the Wilderness. And since that book has come out, she's released this one called Dare to Lead. And Braving the Wilderness was really about how to engage with one's own vulnerability and how to be authentic in your whole self. And this book is more about now that we're vulnerable, now that we're seeking authenticity, how do we engage with other people who think and believe differently than we do? And how do we maintain authenticity and integrity in doing that? And I would never be able to encompass her entire book in one sermon. So instead, I'm going to talk about a particular concept she lifts up in this book. And that is the concept of values. In today's world, Brene says that we try to take on too much. That we spread ourselves too thin trying to engage in every cause and every issue and trying to maintain every value that happens to be needed at any one given moment. And she says that when we try to do so much, when we try to uphold so much and believe in so much, that we end up actually doing very little. Because the lines get blurred and we fatigue. And in my experience, it seems like she's right. So here's my question for you off the top of your head. This is an interactive sermon. I just started teaching at a university, so I now know how to wait. So when I ask you, off the top of your head, what are the values that you believe that you uphold? Honesty? Integrity? Compassion? Loyalty? Grace? Anyone out there? who when I asked that question thought, I don't know. Yeah. Anyone out there who as you hear other people lift up their values, you think, yeah, that's good. Sure, that one. <laughs> yeah, right? What does it mean? What do I even mean by value? In what context? In one framework? For what purpose? Brene gives a list of 100 values, which you can find in your bulletin if you haven't already. And she's compiled these values over the course of her 20-year career as a sociologist. She's interviewed people, and what she says is that as she looked through her past notes, these 100 values popped up with some level of frequency with the people that she talked to. So this isn't a comprehensive list, but based on her research, this is what she came up with. And her suggestion is that Instead of trying to uphold all of these values, which all seem pretty decent, right? Who doesn't want to be loyal? Who doesn't want to maintain integrity? Who doesn't want to maintain grace? But that instead of trying to uphold all of them all the time, is to pare this list of 100 down to two or three, which she says is manageable. Because you can't operate with 100 values at 100% all the time. It's somewhere something has to give. What Brene is suggesting is that you can operate with two or three core values at close to 100% all or most of the time. So I knew that I was not going to be able to pair my list of 100 values down to three in one fail swoop because my brain doesn't work that way and it's very overwhelming to even think about. So what I did was a four-step process. I'm going to take you through my process today. The first uh, thing that I did was look at those 100 values and I circled anything that stood out to me, anything that I thought, oh yeah, that, I, wanna, I want that to be my value. So I came up with 83. <laughs> I actually came up with 82 from Brene's list, and because I'm that person, I wrote in one uh, that wasn't on there. So I wrote in equity. Equality is on Brene's list, but I believe equity and equality are different things, and that's a sermon for another day, but that's what I did, okay? And so once I wrote through these 83, I thought, well, I feel pretty good about that. It's all right, okay? Um, and so the next phase I tried to follow was from this 83 was to circle no more than two per letter. Brene's put this list in alphabetical order, and so logically I thought that's a nice next step. 
And so I could have up to two, but no more than two per letter. So here's what I had. That put me down to 37. And so this, was, this particular step was harder than I anticipated. I had to make some decisions about what I valued more. And the first real struggle I came across was in section F. So in section F, the two that I circled were fairness and forgiveness. And in doing such, I had to acknowledge that as an ordained minister and self-professed Christian and fourth generation preacher, I was not going to circle faith. I didn't know what that really said about me. But at the end of the day, I value fairness because of my commitment to working with vulnerable populations. And I value forgiveness because I know that it is absolutely integral to resolving conflict. So that's what I circled. Despite how I was feeling, I did acknowledge that if you go all the way to the S section, I still have spirituality. So it felt like a, a nice middle ground. And so my next step was to pair that 37 down to 10. So here's where I landed. Accountability, authenticity, courage, grace, forgiveness, inclusion, perseverance, vulnerability, wholeheartedness, and equity. So I got rid of spirituality. <laughs> Despite what this process meant for me, I had to acknowledge that as I went through it, I was doing so for the purpose of sharing it with you, to use this as a tool. Now, I've shared some pretty vulnerable things in front of this congregation, but for whatever reason, it felt particularly vulnerable to stand in front of you not having faith or spirituality on my list. And I started to get really worried about what you all would think as you listen to someone preach about values and faith and spirituality is not on their list. And so I went through the office and started talking to the other people on staff, sort of picking their brain about whether or not we thought this was okay. And through mostly like rolled eyes, they said, yeah, you're fine. What's wrong with you? These are your values. It's okay. And they sort of helped me process through that. And so I think it was a nice step for me, right, to realize that I didn't necessarily have to go through that process alone. And you can pitch ideas off of one another. And so the next thing I did was pare this down, this list of 10 down to 3. So here's what I came up with. Authenticity, inclusion, and equity. And as I process further with other members on our staff team, Jerry McBroom, another associate pastor on staff, uh, sort of said to me, yeah, duh, that totally fits you. Everything that I've ever known about you, these core values fit who you are. So sort of further solidified that process for me. These are my core values. And they really do represent how I operate in the world because I don't know how to be inauthentic. And it pains me to think about having to do it. And it grates on my last nerve when I'm interacting with someone who I feel is being inauthentic. And it's not because I just think everybody should act the way that I act. It's because I believe in making sure that people feel wholly and fully included as their whole authentic selves. So it bothers me if something is happening environmentally or by my own action that makes someone feel like they have to be inauthentic around me. I believe fervently in inclusion, even when it's hard, perhaps especially so. I believe in equity, that is, making sure not, that everyone not only has equal access, but that they have an equal starting point, that they have an equal opportunity to achieve goals. That is because I struggle with the reality of privilege and of disparity and the disproportionate rates in which certain populations are impacted in our world. And it bothers me to engage and interact with others who aren't willing to acknowledge that equity is a real problem. I spent the better half, the better part of a half day just analyzing these three values and it wasn't because I wondered whether or not I truly believed in them. I think it's pretty clear that I do. But it was about whether or not I wondered if I really valued those three above all others. 
were those three really the most important values in my life of this long, expansive list? And I even had this thought, like, should I do it again? Should I go through this process again just to be sure? Would I get the same answers? And of course, people on staff said, oh my gosh, get over it. It's fine. Because the reality is I really do believe in those core values for myself. That is how I view the world there, the lenses with which I operate. And it's also important, it was important for me in particular in this process to acknowledge that these values are not independent of one another. They are fully and completely dependent. Because if I believe in authenticity, then I believe in belonging and connection and wholeheartedness. And it means I believe in seeking and granting forgiveness and grace and joy and hope and so on. And if I believe in inclusion, it is because I have faith in God's enduring and inclusive love. And if I believe in equity, then it means I believe in being vulnerable and having patience for others who are also seeking to be vulnerable. And it means I believe in respecting myself and others as we go through this process of being vulnerable and authentic. And if I believe in those things, then I believe in fairness, and I believe in equality and integrity and justice and so on. And perhaps most importantly, if I believe in the, the ability of myself and others to be authentic and inclusive and to seek equity, then it means that I have hope that the way things are, this division, is not how it has to be. The difference is that leaning into these three values versus 100 is manageable. It doesn't mean that upholding all 100 valuables uh, is impossible. It's not. And this isn't a challenge. But it's difficult. Things get blurred. And it can be overwhelming. And despite society demanding from us that we believe in everything, that we uphold every value, Scripture actually tells us something different. In the Gospel of Matthew, the Pharisees asked Jesus what the number one and number two commandments were. Now, the purpose of their question was to trick Jesus, because Jesus had been teaching and preaching things that were rocking their beliefs. And the Pharisees held values in high regard because they believed that it was central to their faith. And what Jesus was preaching and teaching was suggesting that those values were, in fact, not what was most important to uphold. And they believed, those Pharisees believed deeply in the law. And so they asked him this question about what the number one and number two commandments were because they wanted to trick, trick him. They wanted him to disagree with the law so that they could punish Jesus and in turn silence him. So here's what Jesus had to say. You must love the most high God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That is the greatest and first commandment. The second is like it. You must love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments, the whole law is based. So loving God and our neighbor are the greatest commandments. There's no mistaking that. Jesus is very clear. But what he also points out in this scripture is that holding those two values in the highest regard does not alleviate the necessity of us to maintain the other values involved in the law. Jesus instead is suggesting here that we use loving God and loving our neighbor as a lens with which we operate and view the world, as the way in which we interact with others, which creates some tension with the law at times. There are all kinds of values listed in Scripture that is, were suggested that we uphold. But do all of them can they all be upheld if they're rooted in this sense of love, loving God and our neighbor? And I think that's where that tension comes from. But Jesus isn't suggesting that we just whittle things down into those core values of what we believe. Jesus instead is saying, this is the best way to actually achieve those other beliefs that you have. The best way to achieve those is to make sure that at the foundation you have love. 
And love is on your value sheet. Further, this scripture reveals that when we are overwhelmed by the enormity of being pulled in so many different directions, or by the frustration of constantly being 20 or 30 steps ahead in a conversation, or the fear of wondering whether or not we're going to be able to do it all. that This scripture gives us permission to pause. Just take a moment and to pare things down and remember what we truly believe. Because that list, that 100 values, Someone else might have another 40 or 50. That's not what scripture's saying. It's not saying do it all. It's saying make sure that you're focusing your energies. So this begs the larger question, not just about what we believe, but what we understand the law to be. And my guess is that if we take inventory of what the larger societal discourse is, That that law suggests that we hold the art of judgment in the highest regard. If we go based on that law, it suggests that we are okay with the various forms of dehumanization. And if we hold that law in the highest regard, then it suggests that if someone is saying something that bumps up against what we believe to be our fundamental right or something that we're absolutely able to believe, then they must be lying. Then they must not be telling the truth. That is what the societal discourse is saying. That is not in line with what Jesus holds the law to be. I'm not suggesting that any one person in this room genuinely believes that any of those societal values are law. My guess is that most of us are vehemently against those things. That we believe that they conflict with our core values. But I think sometimes when we're online or we're in discourse one-on-one, it's super easy to get lost in the mix with memes flying left and right, with Facebook comments getting out of hand before we can even blink an eye, it is so easy for us to say and do things that we don't actually believe. And if we're not saying or doing those things, my guess is that somewhere along the way, thoughts are crossing our mind. Thoughts that if we said out loud, we'd probably be ashamed of. So this begs the question, what do we believe? We are getting ready to say goodbye to one year and lean in to another. And I have no idea what 2019 is going to hold for any of us. And I don't know what it means to figure out how to navigate through the discourse that is not going to change in our society anytime soon. But my guess is that figuring out what your core values are, what our core values are, and using that as an opportunity to seek purpose in a new year, that might be a good place to start. You each have your own list of values inside your bulletin. Perhaps a good starting point is to see if you can get that list of 100 down to two or three. And if you think you might have a process uh, similar to mine, don't worry. There are extra copies out in the narthex. And if you're sitting there thinking, that's great, but I really love to do things digitally, don't worry. There's a digital copy online underneath the sermon for today. Because I can't think of anything more important trying to figure out what we really believe. And figuring out what we believe and value isn't just about knowing, it's about doing. This word, valuable, in and of itself is a word of action. What are the values that you are able to uphold? What are the values that you are able to use as a lens with which you view and operate in the world? And are you willing to allow those values to be used as a tool to uphold God's greatest commandment, which is to love. Will we use our values to love not just God, but also our neighbor? 
Well, we use those values as a teaching for our lives and for those with whom we interact. And will we use our values to be the hands and feet of Christ in this world? Because there are no other hands or feet but ours. Will we allow our values to guide us to the journey to love one another as scripture intends? I pray that we do. Amen.